بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر پارٹیسپنٹس ویلکم ٹو دس سیشن اف مورل لیسنز فرام دا قران وی ہیو بین کنڈکٹنگ دس سیشن ان رمضان ایز یو آل نو ان آرڈر ٹو شارپن اور مورل سینسیٹیوٹی ٹوورڈز ا لاٹ اف ایشوز دی بیسٹ وے ٹو ڈو سو ایز ٹو پے اٹینشن ٹو سم اف دیز ورسز ان دا قران وچ ارجز ٹو ونس اگین پے مور اٹینشن ٹو دی مورل گائیڈنس دیٹ وی ہیو ان آور سیلز Today we are going to study Surah Fatiha, which is perhaps the greatest of all supplications and greatest of all du'as, because, because it is the supplication of, uh, of guidance and there can be nothing more, uh, nothing more invigorating than the prayer for guidance. So just as our body needs this uh, fodder to grow, our sp- spiritual self also needs this uh, guidance so guidance when we talk about it uh, of course is something which can only come from god and in the month of ramadan uh, you can we can clearly see that uh, this guidance has come from the almighty in the form of the quran and this is the very reason that we have been asked to fast in the month of ramadan as a me- as a means to show our gratitude to this divine guidance So basically Surah Fatiha is this uh, prayer which uh, which makes us uh, realize that uh, we have this spiritual guidance that we all need and unless it is answered by the almighty uh, we would be left uh, to wander about in many issues and the almighty has been kind enough to guide us so uh, at the very beginning of time when there was this uh, dialogue between Adam and Satan uh and of course uh, the whole episode that we know of creation the almighty had said that he would keep sending his messengers at various instances of time in order to guide mankind and whoever follow his messengers and the books that they bring uh, then they would be the ones whom he would be uh, whom he would reward with paradise so this is uh, in in relation to that promise that the almighty made that when we pray in surah fatiha to give us guidance uh, and we f- immediately find the quran to be that source of guidance so it is so befitting that surah fatiha which is the first surah of the quran it is also the first wahi that was sent down to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in which this prayer for guidance was given and it is as if the rest of the quran is an answer to this prayer and the almighty has started to guide us uh, uh, through the, this quran by by various surahs and through various surahs so just let me share my screen with you and uh, i mean although i don't need to do it because surah fatiha is one surah which all of us have in our hearts uh, so it says alhamdulillahi uh, rabbil alamin arrahman arrahim مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين gratitude is for god only the lord of the universe the most gracious the ever merciful who is the master of the day of judgment lord you alone we worship and only your help we seek bestow on us the guidance of the straight path the path of those you have blessed who have neither gone neither earned your wrath nor have gone astray uh, they, these are sublime words and uh, all of us can see how beautifully uh, they come out when they come out of our heart it is as if uh, this is our own very call it's something so close to our nature and precisely for this reason my dear participants you'll find the surah fatiha or words which are very similar to surah fatiha in the old testament in the new testament and also in the psalms of david so it does seem that this surah it was something which was always part of the divine sharia and in all probability just as we read this surah in every rakat of our prayer it uh, does seem that in previous nations as well in the previous communities as well uh similar words had been revealed and they used to be prayed and they would be prayed in in the prayers of our of the people of the book so it starts off with these uh, sublime words uh alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin which mean gratitude is due to god only only god is someone that we should thank 
generally uh, this verse is translated as uh, all praises belong to the Almighty. I think this is not a very accurate translation because it is alham the way it is expressed here in the rest of the Quran. It actually signifies one's gratitude towards God. It signifies our own thanksgiving towards God and uh, the reason that we thank God and immediately the first words that come to our mind when we think of a deity, when we think of someone who has created us, is this immense gratitude that we owe to him. And this gratitude is something that we experience or, or the, the response which we give in the form of this gratitude uh, is something is so natural because the favors that we experience from the Almighty are something which make us immediately uh, thank him. And we, are, uh, we, we think that this is something which is an acknowledgement that is due upon us. So we think of how the Almighty has taken care of us. Uh, the whole universe has been put to our service, the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the sea, the wind, all these elements of nature, they, are, they have been created to serve none other but us. And then, of course, uh, we find things around us which are of benefit to us. The day has been created uh, so that our body and uh, its own requisites are fulfilled because the day is a time of bustling activity and our own body is, is in line with this, uh, with this day and we do feel like working uh, in daytime. And nighttime is the time of sleep in which our bodies do need rest and of course the darkness of the night it aids this, uh, this resting. So we find uh, the, the, the stars at night guiding us. We find uh, the wind in the morning when we go through various areas and places. It takes us, especially if we are traveling by sea, uh, it is a means of uh, taking ships from one place to another. And then if we go come closer, we find, of course, things which are which have been created by the Almighty for our own service. Look at the animals which uh, work for us uh, and transport us from one place to another. Similarly, there are animals which have been created for us so that we can slaughter them and eat them. And then we have vegetation and then we have so many other vegetables which we grow, which we grow automatically from the ground and which, of course, uh, are meant to be to serve as our fodder. And of course, uh, uh, not only this, we do find that there is this system of family which nourishes us. And this system is something which uh, really makes us uh, go on in life, especially in the various uh, trials and tribulations that we might face. We are able to fall back on our family, our own immediate family, our spouses, our children. They are of immense help to us. And then, of course, our own physical being. The way we are able to see, the way we are able to hear and breathe and walk and talk and climb. There are so many things that we take for granted. But if we have this uh, eye that we able, are able to uh, pay attention that actually these are favors which God has given us. And if we just need to look at people who are deprived of these favors, uh, that we may should realize that how these things are often taken uh, to be granted by all of us. And if we are able to realize these things by contemplating, by maybe going for a nature walk, by thinking every day how much we are blessed with, then you can clearly see that the very first verse of Surah Fatiha, which says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, it is a spontaneous expression of those favors that uh, we enjoy every day, literally enjoy every day. And then it says, uh, Ar Rahim, that God is... Uh, the compassionate, the merciful. Ar Rahman and Rahim are both from the same roots, which is Raham or mercy. But there is a big difference between the two words. For the word Rahman actually means that someone whose mercy has a lot of enthusiasm and is bustling with activity and it is always there to encompass us. It is it's, it, the phenomena of his mercy is 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 like uh, something which envelops us from all sides. And Rahim is uh, an adjective which tells us or an attribute of God that this mercy is not something which just dies away because of uh, the fact that it is so pronounced. No, it stays. So the word mercy actually refers to the consistency in God's mercy. While on the one hand, the word Rahman refers, the word uh, the attribute Rahman refers uh, to, the, to, to the enthusiasm, the fervor in his mercy. Rahim refers to the consistency and the persistence in mercy. It doesn't die away. It stays there. 
And then it says, Malik Ayyamiddin, and he is the master of the day of judgment. So this is the, a natural conclusion that we all draw, that when the Almighty has blessed us with so many favors, we have so much to thank God. This could not be without some purpose. This cannot be without some reason. And precisely the reason which is mentioned actually tells us that this, yes, the reason is that we will be held accountable by the Almighty. He is the master of the day of judgment. This world has been created as a test and trial. He blesses us through various ways. He comforts us. His mercy envelops us. But then we must realize that this is not to make hay. Uh, the purpose of all these blessings is that one day he is going to call us to account. So we end, we continue with this prayer by saying, Malik Yawmideen, Lord, you are the master of the day of judgment. So you can clearly see that Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik, Yawmideen. These are the three introductory sentences which actually uh, sort of connect us to God. And they, they are an acknowledgement of what we have already felt. The next verse, which is the fourth verse, is actually the first verse which addresses the Almighty. It says, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, that since you are... The creator, since you are the one who has blessed us with all these favors, you are compassionate, you are the merciful, you are going to hold us accountable on the day of judgment. So none other but you, that we alone worship you. And it is only befitting to worship someone who has created us. Not only that, but we seek help from you alone. We don't go to anyone else. You are our greatest support. So this is a, some, a very befitting address. So the first three verses are indirect. They don't address directly. They just express our emotions. But the fourth verse is when the, the address, the khitab is then made. It says, Lord, this is now something which makes us realize that we can just worship you. We realize that you are the greatest. We realize that we need to connect with you. And we also realize that there is none other uh, than yourself that we should connect to. And there's none other than you that we should seek help because in this humdrum of life, for the cause of the truth, we will be you know, afflicted with a lot of trials and tribulations. We'll be passing through so many hardships. So it is your help. It is your help that I need. It is your help that we need. We, we rely entirely on your help. You are the greatest support. God guide us to the right path, bestow on us the guidance of the right path, which of course means that we need this external guidance. We are guided innately by those universal uh, uh, universal truths that we know already. Our innate guidance tells us that uh, all of the, the moral uh, precepts that we have in ourselves, they need to be followed, but then uh, they don't complete our guidance. We still find there is something missing. For example, what is the way to reach you? How can we connect with you? How exactly are the worship rituals that might come to our mind, but we are unable to actually give them form or shape? So, Ehdina Sirat al Mustaqim, guide us at how we can connect with you. Similarly, guide us in our affairs that what exactly are some of the areas in which we can in which we at times are at loss to come to a final conclusion. So there are so many things, for example, uh, in our political sphere, whether it is monarchy, which is the right sphere of, or the right form of government, or is it a theocracy or a democracy? So we have various models. So we need your guidance. Similarly, in the social sphere, uh, the, the, the issues of marriage, the issue of divorce, the issue of children, uh, the inheritance laws, there are so many things that we ourselves are, are able to judge. So God, please show us this guidance. And the way this uh, verse is actually uh, is constructed, uh, the Arabic part, you, you, you can uh, think about it as not only telling us that uh, we are seeking guidance, we are actually asking God not only to give guidance, but to uh, make us steadfast on that, that guidance. To make us steadfast on that path which leads to guidance. So, Ehdina Sirat al Mustaqeen. And then that guidance is actually described because this is a prayer which is, uh, which is actually sounded in the times of Prophet Muhammad, in which the two previous ummahs of the two previous uh, nations, the Jews and the Christians, they were the ones who had lost this guidance. They, are the one, they were the ones who, had, uh, uh, who were guided by the Almighty in their own times. 
but then they went astray because of some of their own uh, personal interests for example the jews out of their hatred for the new prophet and the, the christians because of their own uh, their own uh, attitude regarding the divinity of jesus uh, had gone astray so these this is a guidance of a person standing in the time of prophet muhammad looking towards the almighty and asking him that the previous two nations or the israelites taken as a whole they were the they are the ones who have gone astray and i we need your help we need you to guide us and we need you to guide us not in a way that people who have gone astray so sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim we would like you to guide us uh, like the people you have blessed for example the prophets of god who you have blessed not these uh, maghzub alayhim maghzub alayhim is a reference to the jews of the time of the prophet uh, because they were the ones who had invoked the wrath of god because of uh, their own arrogance and zalim are the ones who had gone astray and they refer to the, uh, the to the followers of jesus who because of uh, making god, jesus as god and and uh, making him share god had had gone astray so this is how this prayer keeps us on the straight path and uh, uh, you can clearly see the reason that why we repeat this prayer in every rakat of our prayer uh, because of the fact that it is something that we always need to uh, to connect with god to make us stay on that on that straight path so with these words i will end my talk here and i am now available for all your questions thank you dr shahzad fatma you can have your question assalam alaikum I want to ask that if we are doing a good deed for for Jannah, like we'll get in Jannah in return, is it like an evil or selfish intention? Because at times one is offering namaz, and this thought comes in mind that okay, I'll get Jannah in return, and then another thought comes that oh, you're not offering namaz out of out of love for God, so you're a bad person. I mean, I hope I. I I've made my question clear. Uh, your question is clear. I think the, this is just a way of thinking. Otherwise, uh, the, when, whenever you think of Jannah, uh, there is a step that you skip. I mean, uh, which is the actually the second thought which comes to your mind that, uh, and that is that I'm going to please God. So uh, if you immediately skip this thought and the other thought comes to your mind and that is that oh, because I'm doing this good deed because I will be rewarded. then all that you are doing is you just skipping one step which is already there in your mind and which is that if i do uh, that good deed i am going to please the almighty and as a result i would be rewarded so it's not that when you are doing this uh, when you when this thought comes to your mind you are forgetting god uh, or because that is something which is always there it's just that human beings at times tend to think in a way that they jump to the conclusion uh, at times skipping some of the premises which lie in between and also we need to understand that uh, being rewarded now uh, as a result being rewarded at paradise is an incentive that all of us need in the absence of that incentive uh, we just cannot survive maybe we can do some good deeds for a, for a few months or maybe some more time but in order to have a completely uh, complete assurance for the rest of our life that this is the this is how we were going to uh going to fare in, in the hereafter of course uh, and understood is the fact that pleasing god and then as a result of pleasing god being rewarded uh, that is the only incentive can that can continuously uh, make us go on uh, in doing good deeds so it's like it's only human to think think this way it's not absolutely. selfish or evil it is, it is absolutely human and it is absolutely very normal as well rashni you can have your question now assalam alaikum sir wa alaikum assalam uh, i wanted to know that is the time of our death is pet predetermined if yes then what is the use of becoming fit uh, like taking care of one's health can we affect the longevity of life of course our time is predetermined because but because of the fact that we don't know what time that is so therefore we have to exercise all care so that that uh, care uh, looking after ourselves and not being negligent is something that we have to do because we never know what what that time is for example if we uh, don't end up doing what is required to of us to be done we might hasten our our death even before uh, i mean or we could be someone who would be guilty of not being so careful as ones uh, who should be so you see we have to do 
that we have to exercise care as much as we can at all instances because we never know that when, when that death has been ordained that's something that we never would know unless it happens so unless it happens uh, we have to be careful because if we don't exercise care then out of negligence our death would result and uh, of course it would be written in our in our fate that well such a such a person died because he did not care for his own health did not go to the doctor or did not attend uh, to what the doctor said so it in all cases even if our life has been predetermined our death has been predetermined but because of the fact that we, that we don't know when that date or time is going to arrive uh, we have to do our best we just cannot leave things to fate sir uh, like uh, that way if the patient died by the doctor me, uh, medical negligence then we people uh, blame to the doctor that was not that is not right because if the date is predetermined then why we blame the doctor well the predetermination has this complete sentence written in it that this person will die because of the negligence of the doctor the doctor will be negligent and this would result in his death so the, the our our uh, our fate for, to, so to speak or the knowledge of god uh, regarding a particular soul who has died would be would have this complete uh, information that such and such a person died because of negligence and such was the time of his death uh, so the time of the death of course would be known but the cause also would be known so because of the fact that this cause is known that doesn't mean that we should not uh, go and uh, look after ourselves or uh, not do the needful in finding the best doctor because there is something which is going to happen as a future event because of something that we don't know and there is something that we ought to do because of the fact that we don't know what's going to happen so we have to do our job uh and let god do his job so because if we don't do our job then it what would be written in our, in our fate or it would be in the knowledge of god that uh, such and such a person died because of a car accident or such and such a person died because of a negligence from the medical doctor so this is something which is in the knowledge of god but because of the fact that we don't know about this knowledge uh we ca cannot uh, either become slack or later on think that well because uh, it had been ordained mm, so therefore there is nothing wrong with it uh, it was written in the knowledge of god that we would uh, succumb to certain carelessness of the staff so these are two different things entirely two different phenomena adil qureshi you may ask your question now ji uh, hello doctor why come sir uh, so sir this uh, surah is the first surah that was revealed on the holy prophet uh, in, in near uh, i think not inside but near ghare era is, is that correct uh, this was the first surah that was revealed when uh, uh, gabriel met prophet for the first time as far as the incident of the ghare era or the cave of hira is concerned uh, we have, I, i think i've already critically evaluated those narratives and, and shown to the best of my ability that they are not reliable at all uh, neither did the prophet ever go to that to the to that uh, a cave for uh, for uh, the reason that we generally think of nor is the fact that uh, 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 the first surah to be revealed or the, the first five verses of surah iqra were the ones who, uh, which were revealed so this is the first surah which was revealed to the prophet uh, of course there were the ones who uh, were revealed as a result of gabriel's first meeting and if you would like to ask see a depiction of that meeting then surah najm which is the 53rd surah of the quran the opening verses of surah najm actually depict this first meeting and it was in this meeting that this surah fatiha was revealed yeah before going to the second round i have a couple of written questions or is that a question is that if a person observes fast but does not offer salah on the designated times will that affect uh, the fasting of that person well i think uh, there are two uh, independent things and uh, the acceptance or rejection of worship uh, rituals is something that we need to always leave to god i am no one to judge whether a person's fast is going to be acceptable or not also i am not i, I would not know the reason that he or she is leaving the prayer whether it's deliberate or whether it's out of some compulsion whether it's out of some carelessness or whatever the reason so i think uh, the acceptance of worship rituals is something which is always uh, is, is always something which relates to god and uh, so i would not interfere nor, nor make a comment nor am i in a position to make a comment in this regard i think that such matters need to be consigned to god 
Okay, there's another similar question. If a person engages in those activities after breaking the fast, you know, these activities are the ones which would have broken the fast. So if that person uh, attempts those activities after breaking the fast, will that affect the fast? That's exactly the question. Is. So if you're referring to some of the vulgar activities or immoral activities, they should neither be done in the fast or nor after it. And if, if you're referring to eating and drinking, then of course, they are the ones that were to be abstained from during fasting and you can always do once you break the fast. But uh, if, if perhaps you, you, what you think, what you are implying is, if I understand correctly, is that you indulge in something which is immoral. So whether it's done in the if, if, during the fast, of course, is something which is even more. Uh, even if you think of it as something not r right or correct, but if you abstain from the, those things and you indulge in those things later on, uh, all that can happen is maybe reduce the intensity. But as far as their uh, uh, intensity in being wrong things are concerned, uh, I don't think uh, that would be the case, unless maybe you can give an example. I received a message from the participant that the prayers were missed because of apathy. And apathy. Yes, okay. yeah, and the uh, in activities that were engaged with after breaking the fast were vulgar activities. So I think that both these things need to be abstained from apathy or carelessness or lack of any. Uh, attention towards the prayer is something that should be, uh, I mean, there should always be something that should be in the top uh, list, the top priority. And anything vulgar that you do uh, after your fast, uh, it's, I mean, a vulgarity is a vulgarity, whether you do it in the fast or not. Uh, of course, it increases in intensity when you do something in the fast. It's like saying that, well, uh, you're in the mosque and you're, you're telling a lie in the mosque. I mean, I say these words to a person who is lying to me while standing in the mosque. It would, I would only mean that you are standing in a holy place and then you are lying. This would not mean that if you lie outside the mosque, it would be correct. So if I say something like that, that, well, you're doing indulging in a vulgar activity and that too while fasting, that would only intensify uh, the, the graveness uh, of that sin. But if you do it uh, other than that, for in, in normal, in your normal lifetime where you're not fasting, even then it's not correct. And uh, the word itself tells us that if you're doing something vulgar, uh, so that has to be avoided. So I also have a question in the first round. In Surah Fatah and a lot of traditions, it has been related to the last ayah specifically, where there al maghdubul alayhim and wal dalin. So it has been uh, alluded to two specific ahl kitab, people of book, uh, the Jews and the Christians. But then thereon, we have a whole surah, Surah Baqarah, that alludes to whatever happened to uh, Bani Israel. And it, Allah Ta'ala also praises them to a certain extent. And then we have Al Imran. Uh, which talks about Christians to greater extent. Uh, uh, where mm -hmm. does, in tradition, this uh, comes in the exegesis that Magzubu uh, Ilahim and Dolin are these two categories of people? Well, you'll find exact words of that they were the ones who returned with the wrath of God. For example, it says, The word Ghazab has been so. Uh, I mean, it's so conspicuously used for the Jews of the times of the Prophet. And you'll find this in a number of instances, not only in Surah Baqarah, but in some of the other surahs, like Surah Maida as well, in which they have been uh, taken to task and uh, their uh, misdeeds have been accounted. So uh, the, the, the word wrath or ghazab has become synonymous with, what, uh, uh, with, with the Jews. Uh, if you just read through some of the passages of the Quran, and I think that uh, if you read through some of the exegesis of Surah Fatiha. So people, uh, they are, they are Mufassirun who have cited those verses from the Quran under Ghayr al maghzub alayhim that how, look look at this phrase al maghzub alayhim and how it is repeated for the Jews at so many instances. And then the Zalin of, of course is also something that you'll find in Surah Al Imran that they were the ones, Zallu wa Azallu, they, they went astray and they led other people astray by going after these nitty gritties, by going after the mutashabi heart of the Quran, and by continuously insisting to be told what exactly are these, some of the verses which have only, of course, are, uh, which, which are, which are, which relate to the hereafter, or which relate to certain uh, areas of knowledge, uh, which we cannot grasp because of our lack of faculties related to, uh, to that aspect of knowledge. So the word Zalla and the word Khazab, you'll find it 
very conspic conspicuously used uh, for these two nations in, in those suras. And uh, I, I think once did, when I was in some 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 uh, course or some lecture, I think I have explained this uh, at some place uh, and cited those verses as well. So if you can get hold of that, you'll find that exactly how Al Ghazab and uh, and Zalla are the two words which so conspicuously and so, I mean, they're so distinct that you just cannot miss that they could have been used for someone else than these two nations. Thank you, Dr. Zad. But considering the fact this was the first revelation and it was happening 13 years before Rasulullah's encounters with the Jews and the Christians. So this is why a little problems in reconciliation happens. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Fatma, you can have your question now. Yes, I wanted to ask the status of Walima in Islamic Sharia. I've heard a few Malvis saying that, like, if you don't have the Walima dinner, it's like your relationship will not be valid. So, is it like obligatory thing or is it an optional thing? Walima is there is no such thing as Walima in Islamic Sharia. It's just a banquet that the bridegroom generally throws, and that is all. It has no importance at all in the Sharia. Nowhere at all. The Prophet uh, threw uh, banquets for his wives, but that was just Arab culture. And uh, today also when we conduct Walima, that is just purely a cultural thing. We can totally skip Walima because the only marriage function which has been prescribed by the Sharia is the Nikah. So uh, once the Nikah is done, whether you conduct a Walima or not, whether you have a joint Nikah or you have a joint Walima right at the time of Nikah, that's entirely your choice. The only Islamically valid function or endorsed function is nikah. Other than that, it is your choice. If you want, you can have a walima. If you would, would like to skip it, it's perfectly okay. There is nothing religious about it at all. It is a big misconception. Thank you, Rajni. You can have your question now. Okay. Uh, sir, Islamic banks do not pay interest on deposit. But here in India, either government bank or private banks, they do. Um, okay. So the interest given by bank is prohib prohibited. It cannot be used. But service or common people in India, what they do, because they have to deposit their money in their in their bank. So uh, likewise, is taking loan in interest from regular Indian banks is also prohibited. What can okay. we do, in Indian Muslim? Yeah, two parts Indian of the Yes, I do understand. So there are two parts of your question. As far as taking loan and interest is concerned, this is not forbidden at all because uh, it is basically uh, uh, consuming interest or charging interest or taking interest, which is prohibited. As far as paying interest is concerned, uh, it has not been prohibited anywhere in the Quran, especially when the uh, when situation is such that interest-based transactions are being made. So if you borrow from a bank on and you have to pay back interest, this is nothing uh, wrong as far as the Sharia is concerned. Now, the other question that you said that what, we, what do we do if uh, banks in India, they, for example, they charge or they give interest. So uh, you can see that, well, uh, interest is something that you should not consume at all. And it is only when the circumstances are so compelling and you have no other option. Uh, it's like, uh, for example, as the Quran has said, when there is a situation of compulsion, then even at times you have to lie in order to uh, survive and that is that would not be uh, held against you. So if there is no other option uh, but to earn interest from the bank, there's no way out, for example, for poor people or for widows or maybe for old people or people who have no other way but to earn through a bank. And hopefully God would forgive them. But uh, as far as possible, they should try to look for other avenues. And if there are other avenues, they, could, they should go for them. But if they are not found and there is a chance that a person would end up losing all his money by investing in things which, uh, which, which are not very safe, then yes, uh, this, is a, this is a last resort that uh, people can adopt. Sir, if we calculate the interested uh, own, then uh, it will, if we, we, if we think that it will uh, give to the poor, that can be okay. Yes, that is it. So if you are, uh, if you are placing your money in a savings account and you are being given interest, so uh, instead of using that interest yourself, uh, if you are in a position to, I mean, earn through other means, that what you can do is that you can take out that interest money and just spend it on the society. Thank you, Adil Qureshi. Can I ask you a question? 
Right. So, Dr. Uh, forgive me if I am not using, uh, I don't use the right Arabic uh, grammar terms here uh, or then again, in, uh, incorrect uh, English translations. So, from what I understand, Iyaka Nabudu or Iyaka Nastain, they have this uh, meaning of Hasr in them, which I think uh, implies exclusivity. That only yeah. uh, to Lord uh, uh, we pray and we uh, we ask for. Uh, so, uh, but then uh, when you were translating the first ayah, Alhamdulillah, you I think also um, uh, mentioned it as if it is uh, it has exclusivity. That gratitude is only for for the Lord. So, which uh, grammatic instruction is it that you that ask that uh, implies that this also has some mafum of hasr in it? Uh, in oh, case of uh, now, yeah, one. Yes. I understand. So there is no hasr in Alhamd. All it says is that gratitude is actually. So it's like saying that in fact, thanksgiving is something which is meant for God because He is the originator of all those favors. Even if we get it from His uh, from His creatures, in, uh, indirectly it is from Him because He has made that uh, thing available for us. So He's the first cause. So when we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, and we translated it that gratitude is due for him only or it is in fact he who sh he should be thanked of. We are actually referring to the fact that he is the first cause of, of, of being giver of those favors. Although, I mean, there could be instances in which we receive those favors uh, indirectly from some, some other people or through some other means. But the first cause, I mean, God is behind all these things. So it's just acknowledging that wherever we get those favors, actually they come from God. Right, so there is no hasr in Alhamdulillah, uh, like it is in Iyya Kanaburu or Iyya no, All that is it is placed is there is a certain emphasis which tells us that uh, actual gratitude or gratitude in fact is for God. Because, I mean, if we thank people from whom you might be receiving certain things, uh, I mean, so, so to speak, uh, there is someone who is even behind those people. So the, 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 it's not the hasr which is here, it is the emphasis which is here. Uh, which tells us that the, that real gratitude or actual gratitude is due towards God. Makar Farooq, you can ask your question. Yes, sir. I have a question yeah. about what is the ruling on uh, ittiba? Like, uh, if something is uh, uh, followed, then we should follow that thing that way. So, what is the ruling on ittiba? It depends where, where you use this word. Ittiba means following someone. So if you're talking about the ittaba of the messenger of God, it would mean following his directives. If you're uh, using it as a general word in, in as a, I mean, a general sentence of following people who are righteous. So the word ittaba has, it doesn't have any sanctity attached to it. It's the, it's the relationship with the, of that word with a particular personality or a group of people that would change its meaning. So other than that, the word ittaba only means to follow someone. Deel Qureshi, you can help your question, and that will be the last set question for this session today. So, so just uh, one curiosity I had, uh, uh, what, are your, uh, what, what is your understanding of how to pay Sadka if Fitr? Uh, there are various ways to calculate the, the number itself based on prices of certain commodities. Uh, what is your understanding of it, how to pay, pay Sadka if Fitr, and how to calculate the amount due? So if you gather all the narratives uh, regarding the pay calculation of the Sadka of Fitr, what comes to light is that uh, a day's food that you consume according to your own standards is, uh, if you just convert it into currency, that is what Sadka Fitr is. So, if you whatever whatever food that you generally consume, uh, of course, you have two or three meals per day. So, just calculate the amount of meals that you that you the amount that you spend on those meals, uh, and that would be how you sh you should calculate. And the reason that we have different standards, for example, of dates or at times of other commodities is because uh, they were the staple food in Arabia of those times of various families. So therefore, uh, being a staple food for a particular class of people could vary from uh, society to society, from uh, section to section. So uh, the guidance that we get as a result is just calculate your own uh, daily consumption in currency. And that is the fidya or the fitrana, uh, which you should pay before the Eid namaz. And multiply that with the number of dependents that I have in the family and then yes. that's that needs to be per person. This is per person. So uh, every person is liable, whether he is young or old, uh, he is liable to pay this fitrana. It is regardless of age. Thank you, Dr. Shazad. And that is the end of the questions for today. Okay, inshallah, we'll see each other tomorrow. <laughs>